Welcome to Revival. Let's all come on in if you guys are still in the Welcome Center. Um, let's start with some worship. Scripture says, sing a new song to the Lord. So we got a new one for you guys. It's pretty easy. We'll uh, teach it to y'all. This is how the chorus goes. More than I can comprehend, more than I can understand. Yeah, you've given me the chance to know you, to know you. opportunity to gather with your people. 
God, we ask that as we get to know you more, as we're going through this series and as we're concluding this series tonight, uh, the attributes of you that you've made known uh, through your word. God, let us remember this truth that we will spend all of eternity getting to know you and being in awe and without words in, in, in the new knowledge and the new understanding that we get of you, Lord. Help us to start that here, Lord, that we don't get distracted by uh, worries and cares of this life and miss out on being in awe and in wonder of who you are. And Lord, as we talk about your all-knowing attribute, that we're able to come to a place of worshiping you more, knowing that you know and you've seen and you have planned out our life completely. Thank you, Lord, that when we don't know, you have seen it all and that you can be our God and our lamp, the lamp unto our feet and the path for our life. We thank you, Lord.
What if you had never come to save us? What if you had never given grace? It was love that held you there upon the cross. It was love that led you to the grave. Turn to the person standing next to you and 
to share one, I, I guess, best memory from this week that you have had. Hello, 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 everybody. Welcome to Youth. If this is your first time or you're here every week, thank you so much for coming. Um, this is going to be our last, not our last day because we have next Sunday for our full Q&A, but today is our last uh, sermon on our attributes of God. Um, and let's get a QR code up here. So this QR code is what you can use for the Q&A that we're going to have at the end of this uh, sermon. Um, put your questions in there, and then we'll get to those. Also, we have another QR code, if you can get that up there. This is our QR code for, we have, on the 31st of March, we have an Easter worship night that is also one of our Fresh Start services. So try and invite as many people as you can. Um, if you can scan that QR code, if we could get that back up there. This QR code will have our the set list that the bands will be playing so you can start to listen to it learn some of the songs as well as our instagram pages where you're gonna you can get all of our updates for both fresh start and youth uh, so feel free to scan that it has a bunch of our informations next up our conference that will be taking place here is a full go the dates are may 3rd and 4th so invite people be ready get ready this should be a really fun time also if you are willing to help this is a really big um production a really big like conference we're gonna have three different churches here with us if you want to help please contact mark sagumene he's sitting right there in the middle um if you would if you have that in your heart to help that would be awesome and greatly appreciated um Every other Wednesday, there is a Bible study that takes place at Alex and Jenny's. Is it this week? Okay. They, so next week, not this Wednesday. Next Wednesday will be their Bible study. It is at 6 p.m. at their house. If you want more information, just go to Ale come up to Alex or Jenny. They'll be glad to help you with that. Um, and, yeah, I think that's all the announcements. So without further ado, let's please welcome Dr. Michael Crisp. Good evening. Looks ready. There we go. Well, it's it's a privilege to be with you tonight in this not the last, although next week is a an extended Q and A from what I'm I'm hearing, but in the last presentation on the attributes of God, as you guys have been studying through, and hopefully these um, conversations have been fruitful for you, and you have enjoyed uh, just getting to know God better. And so as we continue through tonight, I'll be speaking on the topic of God's omniscience. But before we get started, I just want to make a few uh, comments for you, kind of as hedges or caveats before we get going. Um, the, the doctrine of God's knowledge is omniscience, is one that we could spend more than just 45 minutes trying to address. Uh, there are numerous volumes written on that, numerous works about the various ideas and theories about how it is that God operates as an all-knowing God. And you just need to know that that's beyond the scope of what I'm addressing tonight. Uh, what we want to do tonight is we want to try to look at what the scriptures tell us about who God is in his knowing, what that looks like, but more importantly, how, how that affects us, how that hopefully leads us to worship, how that impacts our everyday living. And so with that, um, I think it's, it's important to recognize that 
even in some of the questions you may have, there will not be easily reconciled tonight. And I'll address some of that as we go. But for now, let's just know what we're getting into. God's omniscience. This is God knows. It's a conversation about God's all-knowing and the theological and practical implications for us as believers. I am a firm believer, and I believe it's scriptural to think that the better you know God, the more you change. And as we understand who God is and his revelation, there has to be sub substantive change in us. And so we're going to talk about that tonight. This is one of what we would classify as God's attributes. And so I'm sure you've been through this and remember, but just so you know my definitions and where I'm starting from, an attribute is a particular quality or characteristic. It's, it's how we try to explain and express our understanding of God. And as God has revealed himself, he reveals himself to us in ways that we can comprehend through the scriptures. But one of the problems we have is we cannot understand comprehensively or fully God. And so we think about God and we try to categorize God from what we know and how he's revealed himself. And so we look at individual qualities or individual characteristics. And you've done that through this series, whether you've been looking at God's justice or his omnipotence or his omnipresence or his goodness. I believe that's what you went through. And so each of those is a, is a way of trying to think about God, but none of those is totally God. And yet every one of them is completely God. And so when we think about attributes, we're trying to express God from our perspective for what he's revealed back. And so we need to understand that they're just one way of talking about a characteristic. And when we do talk about attributes, it should be clear that each attribute is simply a way of describing one aspect of God, but God himself is unity, and he is unity in trinity, and a unified and completely integrated whole person who is infinitely perfect in all of his attributes. And so God is good, and God is just, and his goodness and his justice never have to be in competition to exist or to be exemplified, and yet God not only, he's not only just good, and he's not only just just, but he is always perfectly, completely good, and always perfectly, completely just, right? That's hard. It's hard for us to understand this, but it is an, an endeavor that we ought to engage in. And so when we think about this, we're talking about attributes, and so I get that one category of God's totality, and it's his attribute of knowing. We call it his omniscience, his all-knowing. And I'm using for my launching point the Baptist Faith and Message 2000, which was the confession of faith for my denomination, and maybe yours too. And it says that God is all-powerful and all-knowing, and his perfect knowledge extends to all things, past, present, and future, including the future decisions of his free creatures, and to him we owe the highest love, reverence, and obedience. That's going to be our baseline tonight of what we're talking about, especially when it comes to God's all-knowing. Now, I told you that, that we wouldn't be able to address all of the caveats of this, but I will spend a few minutes just bringing you up to speed on a little bit of conversation that exists out there in the conversation about God's omniscience. Usually where debate starts, it's not in the fact that we think God is all-knowing. It's when we want to know how God operates as an all-knowing God in his providence over creation and how he, he, he rules and how he reigns, especially over us as free creatures. And so usually when we get into those conversations, the definitions are important and the, the debates begin over what it means to be free and what it means to be providential. And we don't have time to discuss all that tonight. And I just want you to know that there, that is usually where any debate about omniscience arises, at least in the people I'm, I'm dealing with. And there's a couple of 
of theories on that. You can either find yourself falling truly in an Arminian type camp or maybe into what has been termed Molinism. Maybe you're in some kind of compatibilism or maybe you're just a straight uh, open theist. Now, of those three, I think I can get along in fellowship with, with you if you fall into the first three. We'll talk about open theism a little later, but open theism is a rejection of what this statement makes. Open theism says that God is not capable of knowing the future. And so be cautious in your discussions about God's omniscience that you avoid anyone who says that God can't know the future because as soon as God has to stop being supreme, he stops being God. And so we want to make sure that we don't cross that bridge. And we want to remind ourselves of what Job said in Job 12, 13, wisdom and might are with him. Advice and understanding belong to him. We are actually engaging in a conversation that is technically only God's to have. His is knowledge. His is wisdom. His is understanding. And we just get to engage in it mainly because he allows us through his revelation. So let's start with answering some questions. How does God know? Well, the first thing I would remind us is that God does not possess knowledge. God is perfect knowledge. As an attribute of him, he knows all and he knows all things perfectly. This is hard for us to comprehend because of where we begin our journeys, but God does not gain knowledge. God does not have to go to school to be educated on how to be God. He is perfect knowledge. He does not add to his, his knowledge. He does not add to his learning. He does not learn new details about life. He is not sitting up there watching us engage and changing along the way to accommodate us. God is perfect knowledge. He also does not forget what was previously known. In fact, knowledge is not part of God's being. It's not one pursuit of his, of his being that allows him to be a better being. God is perfect knowledge. Now let that sink in for just a minute because that's how we're having to describe this attribute, right? We're talking about God's all-knowing nature, the nature of him that is all-knowing. This is not just a segment. It is part of his totality. And I love this next statement. God does not need to count the stars or the sand to know their number. He knows. Knowledge belongs to the Lord. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Now, it's a couple of those theories about God's engagement over, over being providential come up when we think about the fact that, that God doesn't learn. Process theology, which is an, or, an open doorway to open theism, says that God is actually learning and that God is engaging us based upon what he learns about us. So the more decisions we make, the more God can know and the better God he can be. That's not the God of the Bible. In fact, process theology teaches that God ultimately only eternally changes, that God has to change. That's, that's part of his eterni eternity that, that's fixed because if, as he learns, he has to change, right? He's have to adapt. But if you have an infinite eternal God who is always infinitely eternally changing, then you have a God who is only temporarily possessing any single attribute at any single time. And therefore, what you have is not a God that is infinite and eternal. What you have is a God who is eternally temporal. And because he cannot possess his, his attributes consistently forever, you never know which attributes your God has, and therefore, he is not a God you can trust. This is not the God of the Scriptures. This is not the God of the Bible, because God is perfect knowledge. God is infinite. He has no beginning. He has no end. God is not becoming. And because God is infinite, his knowledge is infinite. 
God is unlimited. There are no restraints on him. There is no power above him. You talked last week about him being uh, omnipresent. We've talked about his omnipotence at times. We, we know that God is God because if anything rules over him, he is not supreme. And so he is unlimited in his scope. His knowledge is not limited. His, his infinite and his, and his grandest, grandeur is, is for us. And because God is unlimited, he's not bound by time. He's not bound by space. He's not bound by us. His knowledge is also unlimited. In fact, God knows perfectly himself. And God is the only being that perfectly knows himself and his total aspect of being and his activities. Let me illustrate it this way. God is the only one who knows how his love and his justice cooperate at the same time, but are never in competition and never has one to be diminished so that one can be exalted. God is infinite and he is unlimited in his operation and God perfectly knows himself. And so for us, we need to be aware of that. Because when we start talking about attributes and we start engaging in these conversations, we have a tendency to make some pretty sweeping generalizations or some very confident assertions. I know God. We are just rehearsing back our understanding. That's one of our problems. Our knowledge is imperfect. We are finite. We, we know that our days are numbered. Some of you aren't old enough to start feel, feeling the pains of middle age yet, but your pastor does. I do. Once you hit 40, it's all downhill. Everything's uncomfortable. Things hurt like they didn't used to hurt. Every, you know, the body aches. It's evidence that we're aging. We pride ourselves on knowing, but we have to go to school to learn. And some of us go to school for a long time in pursuits of learning, and, and we call that great accomplishment. And yet, some that you know have a problem remembering. The longer we live and the longer we exist, sooner or later we're going to have more things that we have forgotten than things that we remember. In fact, our knowledge is as finite as us. We, we live sequentially from one moment to the next trying to piece together reality so that we can interpret it and so we can make sense of it. And so we are limited in that. We are finite in our understanding. None of us has the ability to fully comprehend. We do have the capacity to learn new things, to forget old things, and yet, we also have the capacity to wonder about the future. When we think about the future, we have no certainty. Because the scriptures tell us, tomorrow is not promised. When we think about our imperfect knowledge, it can be, it can be intimidating to try and make assertions and to think about God. I would say that most of us have no problem agreeing and affirming that we are finite and limited. How many of you struggled choosing what you would eat for breakfast this morning? How many of you spent more time getting dressed than was necessary because you had to make sure it was perfect? We even struggled to make everyday decisions. How in the world could we ever claim to be a God who engages the entirety of his creation simultaneously, all at once, without limit, infinitely, eternally. Our knowledge is limited. But we do desire knowledge. We want to know. In fact, I believe Scripture testifies in Genesis chapter 3, that's part of where man's problem began. When God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, 
they were already morally culpable creation. They were there to be stewards of what God had created. They were there to honor and enjoy fellowship with God. And God set boundaries around what they were allowed to do. Particularly, they were not allowed to eat of one tree. Everything else in the garden, they had permission to enjoy but one tree. And that tree was a knowledge of good and evil. And so we know that they were in an imposition under God to be subordinate to God because they had to follow God's rules and do it God's way. And so when we think about that, we need to also comprehend that man was created to be dependent on God and not independent of God or superior to God. And God said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But the serpent of old came in and said, you should eat of the tree because if you do it, you will be like God. And when they saw that it was appealing to the sight and good for food, they ate. And the human story has been on a trajectory of death and sin ever since. But we do want to know. We want to know what we're missing out on. We want to know what everybody else is enjoying. We want to ask the questions, why not me? Because in our understanding of self, we think we deserve something. But we have to be careful because as humanity, we begin with the finite and try to build and construct to the infinite. We take what we know filtered through our authorities, whether it be scripture or experience or tradition or whatever your epistemology is, and we start to comprehend something about God, and then we think we can make a statement about God. I had a parking lot that was full, but I went to the mall and one spot was empty and it was right by the door and God gave it to me, therefore God must be good. And so we make an assertion about who God is based on an experience we had. We're arguing from the finite trying to explain the infinite. And if we're not careful, that will result in idolatry and sin because we will be making a God that we can comprehend. We will be explaining a God that we like. We will very soon be claiming as a God to know all there is to know about God. And that's not possible. Charles Spurgeon says this, God's knowledge surpasses not only our comprehension, but also our imagination. You have never had an imagination dream that was worthy of the glory of our God. Our mind, according to Spurgeon, has no line. That's his means of measuring. It has no line which can measure the infinite. We have desire, but we lack capacity. So we need to be honest and cautious in our pursuit of knowledge because great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is what? Unsearchable. Unsearchable. That seems to leave us in a pretty bad situation, doesn't it? So what can we know about God? First, we need to confess that we can never fully understand God. There's a subcategory of this doctrine that we teach called the incomprehensibility of God that says that I cannot fully and, and, and ultimately comprehend everything about God. Because to do that, I would have to know God as he knows himself. And not only can I not fully understand the totality of God, I can never fully understand a single aspect or attribute of God. I just told you, there's, there's hundreds of books written on how God operates as an all-knowing and yet providential God. Because theologians can't agree on how God does it. And we're supposed to be the ones who study the scriptures the most. But we can't reason from the finite to the infinite well enough to make a slam dunk argument for what we believe God is and who he should be. We know only in part. We're limited because we can never know God in the same manner as he knows himself, eternally, infinitely, unlimited. As we learn of God, here's some good news. You can actually never learn too much. 
There will always be something about God worth knowing and something that you need to learn. We know God through his revelation. God has revealed himself to us in creation. God has revealed specifics of his character to us in the scriptures. And this is true. Everything the scripture reveals to us about God is true. So even if we can only know God in part, whatever we know about God, we can know truly. We can understand concepts of who God is in truth because Scripture is truth. We know Him. And folks, that's the point, okay? If you don't hear anything else I have to say tonight, let me make sure you understand this. The goal is to know God, not facts about Him. You can die and slip into eternity lost with lots of facts about God. But if you know him, everything changes. Romans 11 says, Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable and how unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it would be paid back to him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. And to him be glory forever. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 13 says, Who has directed the spirit of the Lord or who is his counselor has informed him? With whom did he consult and who gave him understanding? And who taught him in the path of justice and taught him knowledge and informed him in the way of understanding? The Romans passage and the Isaiah passage are both asking rhetorical questions because if we truly understand that God is infinite and God is unlimited and that we can't fully know him, the answer to those questions is no one. No one has instructed God. Because again, God is perfect knowledge. He doesn't just attain knowledge. We can speculate a lot, and it's fun to do, about how God brought the cosmos into existence. We love to go high-level theoretical. Was it a big bang? Was it a big word? Was was God active in different aspects of the world? Why why the flood? Why this? Why that? We want to comprehend and understand God, and we want to be able to give a reasonable explanation for it. But we're limited in that sense because God is not asking our permission to be perfect knowledge. God does not need us because of his aseity. He is a self-sufficient being. God is not dependent on us. We are dependent on him, and yet we spend most of our time questioning him. Not to know him better, but to accuse him of not doing it right. Our understanding of God and his perfect knowledge has to sink from the head to the heart so that we start to understand why he reveals himself to us in the scriptures to know him as perfect knowledge. And one of the premises of of my ministry and my entire thinking is this, God reveals himself to us because he wants to be known. And in knowing him, we benefit. The more we know of God, the more we benefit from him. And this concept for us has to take root in our hearts because if not, we're going to be pointing fingers at God, accusing him of not being what we think he ought to be when God could be looking back at us and saying, you're not what I made you to be. But we're not asking what he wants and his purposes for us. We're not asking what he wants and his goals and desires for us. We're not asking how we fit into his plans We're always trying to make sure God's favorable to us so that we can beg him to work in our plans. But God doesn't just know the big things, right? There's part of God's knowledge over us, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, whoever's here, that have two, two emotions that well up in you. It will either comfort you or it will scare you. 
And that's the fact that God's knowledge is not limited to just abstract concepts. It includes you. In Genesis 16, 13, Hagar has just escaped from Abraham and Sarah. And she's taken her son into the wilderness in her mind to die. And while she's out there in the wilderness suffering, she cries out to God that God would help. And God intervenes. And he tells her, I have seen you and the boy. And everything's going to be all right. And she calls him in the Hebrew tongue, El Roy, because he is the God who sees. Scripture says a lot about the God who sees. Psalm 44, 20 says that if we have forgotten the name of our God or extended our hands to a strange God, would God not find this out? For he knows the secrets of the heart. 1 Samuel 16, 7, when Samuel has gone to anoint David as the next king of Israel, God tells him not to look at the appearance of height or stature because he's rejected that particular son of Jesse. For God does not look and see as man sees, since man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. Hebrews 4.13 says, There is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him to whom we must answer. For the eyes of the Lord roam throughout the earth so that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. God's knowledge goes beyond just metaphysics. It's intimate. It's about us. God sees us, and anything that is in the realm and the scope of God's observation is under his rule. It is his creation. It is under his domain on knowledge and knowing. God knows us. Everything that you have in your mind, everything in your heart, every action you make, God knows it. And everything that you think you've hidden from everyone else in the world is not hidden from God. And if anyone has an opinion about your life that should matter, it is the God who sees. God's knowledge includes knowing us. He knows us far beyond our own knowledge of self. He knows us in our every action, our every thought, every activity, all of our motives, like I said, that's either a comfort to you or that scares you. You know why it scares us? Because we spend most of our lives trying to hide who we really are. The problem with trying to hide who we really are is that God, the God who sees, knows who we really are and no one can hide. blessing of it all is, is though God does know us, and he knows what we need. He knows what we require. In Matthew chapter 6, he says that God knows what we have need of before we ever ask. Matthew 10, it says that all the hairs of your head are numbered. God's knowledge of us is intimate, and it's particular, but it also helps us to understand that he can meet our needs, and God, in fact, knows our greatest need. When we think about the infinite knowledge of God, we have to ask ourselves how it benefits us. How does knowing God benefit us? Psalm 139. I don't know when you've read this last, but I'm sure it's come up more than once in this particular series. It's one of those passages of Scripture that deals with with multiple aspects of God's uh, attributes. It speaks both to his omniscience and his omnipresence. It also speaks in a, little, in a way to his creativity, which is how, as a side note, his creativity reflects both his perfect knowledge and his perfect power. God can know and God can bring about. So God is his own 
limitation in what God does is without limit. And so we have to understand that. That's who we know God to be. Psalm 139 says uh, this, this passage reveals just what God knows about us. So let's take just a few minutes to walk through it in a few of the verses. Psalm of David, he writes, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there was a word on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it. You have enclosed me before and behind. You laid your hand upon me. And such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain it. David's making a confession here that I think all of us, if we're honest with ourselves and with God, can share. We know that God sees. But what we may not be aware of is that God sees deeply. To be searched and to be known as this passage is describing is to, is to indicate that there is no part of you that God has no knowledge of. You may think that you're safe, and you may think that people don't know, but you are totally and utterly exposed to the eyes of an all-knowing God. You have searched me. And now, this may be in the past tense, in the Cal perfect. We understand that the languages that we have to use to capture God's activity don't always express the continuity. God is continually searching and knowing. He is not a God who ever takes a break. He's not a God who sleeps and slumbers. You get tired. You get fatigued. You want to go home and take a nap. We all want to rest, but we don't understand that the same way God does because God does not get tired. God does not have to go home and rest. You're not going to pull off an activity today when God's on his break because God does never take a break. God is searching and knowing because he is perfect knowledge. He cannot stop being who he is. And you and I are under his gaze. He knows us. He searches us. He knows us. He knows every aspect of what we do when we sit down and when we rise up. God knows what time your alarm goes off. He knows how many times you hit snooze. He knows how late you stay up. He knows what you're doing when you stay up late. He knows your thoughts from afar. I don't think this speaks of spatial limit, like I'm trying to read thoughts on this side of the room or read thoughts on this side of the room. This means that God knows the thoughts that are going to pass through your head before you even have the thoughts pass through your head. God is a God who is working in, in, in providentially ruling over this creation. He is not bound by time. Again, he has no beginning. He has no end. He sees everything simultaneously. The past the present, the future. There is no guessing game with him. There is no lack of comprehension and understanding with him. He can hear the prayers of millions of his saints all at once and never once do his ears get confused about whose voice it is and what petition they're making. He is a God who knows our thoughts. He knows everything about us. He can scrutinize our path and he can even know our lying down. He can see the pattern and the manner of our life, and he can say whether it's right or wrong. He can even pass judgment on us because he is an all-knowing God. Even before there's a word on my tongue. It speaks of motive and heart, right? Before you ever start to articulate your emotions and what you're thinking, God has already been aware of it. God has already known it. How much of our our speaking would we keep silent in if we, if we truly understood that? How many of our thoughts would we take captive and surrender them to Christ if we actually comprehended the fact that God is already evaluating and knowing our thoughts? In fact, David says, behold, Lord, you know it all. There's no doubt in his mind of who God is. He says, you have encircled me behind and before. The Hebrew could be translated right there. You have besieged me. You have set up camp around me and surrounded me. Why would you do that, right? You're about to conquer a city, so you build siege works. You besiege the city. You cut off all avenues of escape. You cut off all avenues of hope. You make sure that your presence is the dominant presence felt. 
And folks, if we're not in Christ and we're not walking with Christ, the knowledge of God's presence will either be to us a comfort or a besieging army that scares us, it frightens us, and it brings us lack of comfort. It brings us fear. And David says, you have enclosed me. And you have, you have even laid your hand on me. You're close enough to be a guide to me. You are close enough to keep me on the path, to stop me from going down the wrong path. You are intimately involved in my direction in my life. Such knowledge is too wonderful. That's where we get that incomprehensibility. David says, I can't even fathom it. I can't comprehend it. I can't understand it. I can't deny it, but I can't explain it. And that's exactly what God's all-knowing does. It leaves us in a position where we, we can't deny it, but oftentimes we can't explain it. You can't avoid it either. Now let me ask you a question. Now that you know that God knows everything about you, what would you change? See, that's another part of God's knowledge that he doesn't have to deal with. God doesn't live with regret. God never acts or thinks or does and then turns around and says, I blew it. But see, that's the blessing that we have because even in spite of God knowing us, the faults in your head, the search history on your computer, where you go, who you hang out with, what you're doing, even though he knows that reality, he didn't abandon us. He didn't forsake us. In fact, that's how he meets our greatest need. Read what verse 17 says, how precious are your thoughts to me. How vast is the sum of them. God's not sitting in heaven as so many people paint him, just waiting with his lightning bolts to throw them at us and cast judgment on us and do us in. In fact, if the opposite's true, God is a redemptive, loving God, and his thoughts for us are precious. They are, they are for us and for our benefit, and they're not just singular, they are vast. God has good intentions for us. God has good purposes for us. In fact, David says, were I to count them, I would have to count and they would outnumber the sand. And when I awake, they're still there. I, I just can't escape the presence of God. Let me ask you this. Why would you want to? If the all-knowing God who has uncountable, unmeasurable faults of goodness towards you, intimately knows you and yet did not abandon you and is working in your favor, why would you want to get away? That may not be a hypothetical. Maybe the answer is, is because what God is asking of you, you're not willing to surrender. What God would have of you, you're not willing to give. You really don't think he's all-knowing. But not only does God know about us, there's another truth, too, that God knows those who are his. Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands having this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. Everyone who names the name of the Lord must keep away from wickedness. Romans 8, 28, we trust him in providence, don't we? We quote this verse all the time and we invoke his ability to do things well for our benefit because we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. But Jeremiah is a good warning for us. This is what the Lord says, that no man... No wise man boast of his wisdom, nor let the mighty man boast of his might, nor rich man boast of his riches, but let the one who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. But wait, didn't you just tell us we can't know God? 
not in the fullness that he does, but here's what you can know about God. That the Lord exercises mercy, justice, and righteousness on the earth. You can know that about him. You can respond to that about him. You can agree with him about that. And then you can delight in these things. You can delight in the Lord. When you think about the goodness of God and when you start thinking about his all-knowing nature, maybe like Paul, we need to, to write and to think now to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. Be glory forever and ever. Amen. What does God know about you? What does God know about you? Are you his? We will know this, that we are of the truth and will set our heart at ease before him, that if our heart condemns us, that God is greater than our heart and he knows all things. We need to understand that when we deal with this concept of God's omniscience, it's not just a hypothetical question for theological debate. It's not whether you can articulate and pontificate well about all these little nuances and attributes of what you understand God to be. It's now in our mind to think and know that if this is who God is, if this is how Scripture reveals him to be, what impact does that have on us? How do you respond to a God who knows everything about you? What do you do? Maybe like David, we need to pray the prayer of the end of that Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know me. Know my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me. And then lead me in the way everlasting. There are two options, really, when we understand that God knows us. We can submit to him or we can try to run from him. But we can never outrun him. Let's make this even a little bit more application. Whether we like it or not, some of us constantly live in a way that we challenge God's knowledge and wisdom. If we do this when we second guess his word, question his character, or deny his purposes. When we see in the scriptures something that is true for us, true for the, from, from God that we, we should obey and we don't obey it, we're really arguing that he doesn't know best. When we approach the world around us today, folks, there, there's so many different people telling you so many different things about how you should live. And everybody's flying their flag. Everybody's championing their cause. Everybody wants you to be happy. And very little of what the world says will make you happy will actually create in you holiness and so we have to be careful because when, when God sets a standard, we aren't privileged and we aren't enabled to just deny it. We could put this in perspective. If God says you shall not murder, you don't get to choose that murder is okay, ever. And you avoid the conversation about whether moral, mor murder is moral or immoral because we start talking about when does life begin or when does quality of life end. And so all through our culture, we're talking about things like abortion and eugenics, and we're talking about care of the elderly and care of the old and life quality, and we're making decisions about that based on what someone else might perceive. And so we haven't really valued what God has said about the quality and the value of life. Every person who bears the image of God has value. Every verse from that Psalm 139 that David goes on to speak about where he says, God has knit me together in my mother's womb. He has stitched me. He has known me. He has created me. He has seen the parts of my body that existed before the rest of the world could even comprehend it. Tells us that God has intimate knowledge of life and when it begins. And if God speaks, we don't get to overrule him. 
If God says that he created marriage between one man and one woman for life, we don't get to change that rule and that precept because it makes us happy. That's not how this works. In fact, you don't get to say that your sin makes you happy and God doesn't care because then not only are you questioning his word, you're questioning his character. Because if God told you that, that, let's just go back to the marriage, if marriage is good and marriage is right and it's between man and woman and it's, and it's got its benefits of intimacy that occur within marriage and you go outside the marriage relationship to do things that you're not allowed to do with someone who's not your spouse... If you do it before you're married, that's not your spouse. And you justify it saying that you just want to be happy. And maybe you've even heard this. As a pastor, I've heard this. People tell me, well, God has told me it's okay because he wants me to be happy. People, that's, that's us with limited, finite understanding trying to tell an all-knowing God how to run his show. You really don't know what's best for you. He does. Maybe you would argue that there are multiple avenues of salvation. Well, you are, you are actually contradicting God's purposes. You are challenging his all-knowing because he said that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one can go to the Father except by him. You, you don't get to just create pluralistic systems that make you feel better about not being condemned you don't get to create your little idol gods and set them on your shelf and then tell them that they are over you and control you when you have to dust them and keep them clean. You, you, have, you have to understand that to, to have a God who is all-knowing, who is perfect knowledge, requires from us a spirit of submission. We are created to be dependent on him, so it's time that we stop challenging him by second-guessing his word, his character, and his purposes. Folks, what God knows about us and what God provides for us is good and right because God never misjudges and he never misunderstands us. Your friends may misunderstand you. Your families may not comprehend you. God is not guilty of that. He knows you. He will provide the best for you. There's another omni that we didn't talk about, his omnibenevolence. God is capable of doing the best things. And in his wisdom and in his power, he is able to accomplish the best things for us. And therefore, his one thing is the best thing. So he's omnisapient because he can come up with the best plan and he can pull it off. God is not up there wringing his hands trying to figure out how to give us good things. He has given us good things and he's... he's enticing us to accept it and to submit and to agree with him. Here's what should happen. Here's an application for us. Knowing that God is acquainted with our ways should lead us to three things. It should lead us to worship. You should worship because the God who knows everything about you still allows you into his presence. He doesn't just allow you into his presence. He invites you into his presence. And he doesn't just invite you to his presence. He provided the way for you to be in his presence. God provides for us. He answered our best question. He provided for our greatest need. He gave us salvation through Jesus Christ so that we would not have to be separated from him. And that's even knowing us. Because God demonstrated that he loved us by having Christ die for us while we were yet sinners. When we think about that, that should lead us to worship. It, it should lead us to, to, to just open our hearts and bow our knees and just to be able to confess we don't understand it, but we enjoy it and we love it and we're thankful for it. If you can't worship in the presence of a God who is all-knowing, I'm not sure you can worship. Remember, he knows whether you're making up the thoughts. He knows whether you're just placating him for something else. He knows whether that's a genuine confession of your heart, that you are great and good. It should lead us to trust. If God has besieged us, if God has encircled us and encamped around us, if God's hand is on us to lead us, if, if he is our shepherd and we shall not want, folks, we should trust. 
We should trust him, that his ways are good, that his way is best. There should be a submission of our heart to him that we would live in such a way that we don't fear, that we don't approach this world as if we can't have answers, that we can't know God, that we can't find what we're looking for in this life. God has worked it out in his wisdom. He has made it known in his word. God is a God of all knowing. If he already knows, why can't you trust him? See, most of us live as if God is incapable of knowing the future. That open theism I talked about, we live as if somehow it's up to us to figure out our path, to figure out our portion. And that is not at all who God is. But not only that, it should, we should respond in delight so that we don't stray. In worship, we're responding to God and who he is in delight. We're enjoying his presence. When's the last time you you truly and thoroughly just enjoyed being with God? Not to go to him in his word to try and find a verse that makes us feel good about our situation or to try and placate some fear we have in our heart of being found out. Not the shame that we carry and hope he can cover, but just to go into him knowing he knows everything about us and yet he invites us to be there to just delight in him. We can never escape God's judgment by trying to evade him, trying to trick him, trying to avoid him, or outrun him. God is an all-knowing, all-present God. The only way to escape his judgment is to run to him. And he has made that path available. In Christ, all of the wisdom of God dwells. We have a perfect plan that God knew. Paul says in Ephesians that Christ was a lamb slain before the foundations of the world. That God predestined him to be our Savior. That God knew our greatest need. And in the fullness of time, according to Galatians chapter 4, God sent forth his Son to be born of woman, born under the law, so that he could redeem us. God didn't spare his own son to be able to invite us into his presence because he knew our greatest need. He knew we couldn't figure it out on our own. He knew that we couldn't earn his righteousness. And so to meet our greatest need, God provided righteousness for us. So I have to ask, have you trusted in God's perfect and infinite knowledge by receiving his greatest and completest gift. His most complete gift to us is Christ. It's probably not the lecture or the presentation you expected on God's omniscience. In fact, I don't know what you expected. But folks, there's just something about an all-knowing God that should lead us into deeper worship and deeper trust and deeper delight. If you're here tonight and you've never given your life to Christ and you can agree with God about his wisdom being best, you can offer yourself to Christ and accept him as your Savior. If you're a follower of Christ, you can stop challenging his wisdom and knowledge by questioning his character, questioning his word, and questioning his purposes. Ours is a singular, simple task. To know him as he has revealed himself through Christ. I don't know what the need of your heart is tonight, but God can meet it. And he already knows. So the most authentic act of worship right now for you is to be honest with him. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Our worship team is going to come back up and lead us. And then we'll continue with the program. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for your truth. Your word is truth. 
Thank you, God, that you are perfect knowledge. And thank you that you have made yourself known in such a way that we can know you and comprehend you through your spirit and through your word and through your son. And we pray, God, that you would open our hearts and open our minds to be honest with ourselves and agree with you about what you already know about us. And Father, may knowing you as you revealed yourself in Scripture, in word and in truth, impact our hearts, change our lives. And help us to delight in your presence. We thank you, God, that you met our greatest need in Christ gift of salvation and we give thanks to you that in your perfect knowledge you reveal truth to us of our need search me O God and know my heart dig through my life and see if there's any wicked way in me. God, that's your business. That's your territory. That is exactly what you do. And God, when you see it, be gracious in how you make it known to me. Give me the courage and the strength to agree with you about it. And ultimately, God, in your perfect knowing, lead me in the paths of righteousness in the way everlasting. And to you, the immortal, invisible, only wide God, our King eternal, be glory and honor forever. In Jesus' name. of my soul I have witnessed a mystery I can't put it to when I try to explain you it just doesn't describe you're in every direction before our eyes more than I can comprehend more than I can understand yeah
Searchable are your ways. How unfathomable. I cannot comprehend it. That, that psalm goes on to talk about we can't escape his presence wherever we go. We can try hiding. And even there, in the deepest, darkest areas of our life, he is still there. Does that bring fear or does that bring calm? Does that bring rest? Does, it, does that bring peace into your soul? Let's sing that bridge. Let that be the anthem of our life. I want to know you more than I know. Then I know you now. I want to know more than I know you. I want to know you more than I know you now. ready? Yeah, let's go Q&A. How does it feel to uh, be saying a sermon and knowing that there's a pile up of questions happening behind the <laughs> background? <laughs> you, don't, you don't think about it. <laughs> you don't think about it? No. <laughs> All right. Well, let's get into it. All right. So again, we'll, we will give prep or not preference. We'll give uh, 
I guess, first dibs to the uh, questions that are more relevant to this topic, and then we will definitely cover questions that are relevant to our lives elsewhere. So one of the, the, uh, pop, the most popular question was, if God knows everything but Satan does not, how much does Satan know about each of us? Can Satan read our thoughts and or how much of our thoughts can he read? That's an interesting question. Um, yeah, Satan is definitely a, a finite creation, and so he is not omniscient, and he is not all present. And I think a pastoral answer would be, he knows as much about you as you allow him to know. If you give in to temptation and you open doors and pathways for sin, then, then you are exposing yourself in a lot of ways to what uh, his desires and his work is to accomplish in you. But God, he does not have perfect knowledge of you. I don't believe that the scripture teaches he has perfect wisdom over you, that he has a power that can't be defeated in you. Um, in fact, I think the opposite's true. God, God tells us that we need to be assured as believers that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so the power of Christ in me, I have the mind of Christ, and therefore I'm not the servant of the enemy. And so that, that definitely limits his ability to know me and his power over me. I'll give you a, a passage to think about. Paul says in Romans, that I think it's chapter 6, that, that whatever you submit yourself to becomes your master. And as believers, we have a, a right and a reasonable expectation that we will submit to Christ so that he is our master. And that we will not submit to sin and make sin our master. And so we limit the impact of what Satan knows and can do in us by not submitting to his devices. And his devices are any things that lead us to question God's character, his goodness, or his word and his purposes. Is that sufficient? There was one com comment that said, uh, I recommend reading Screw Tape Letters. Have you read that book? Yeah. C.S. Lewis, he writes a book. If you're not familiar with screw tape letters, it's, it's written from a, um, a demon's pos position. It's a point of view where uh, screw tape and his minions are trying to figure out how best to invade humanity's thinking and to lead them astray. And so it's a strategy book, but they have lots of problems because there's this wonderful, omnipotent power that they can't overcome. I've never read that book, but I've heard it was really good. All right, next question. How does God's omniscience explain uh, his grief or regret of creating humanity, for instance, in Noah's case, or choosing the nation of Israel and saving them from the slavery in Egypt? Yeah, so those are some of those complexities that have led to the numerous positions that I talked about. Uh, most of your open theists, most of your process theologians will rely on passages like that of the Old Testament to build their case of God's being surprised or God being in process. Sometimes we just have to acknowledge that when God's revealing himself to us, he's expressing himself also in ways that relate to our emotions and our understanding so that we catch what's happening. And while God is not like man that he should change his mind, according to Isaiah, at the same time we see in Scripture that God says he repents of doing something. And that's not the way that we would interpret it for our behaviors, but that's God's way of expressing through an anthropomorphism that he is, he is revealing to us something that is so significant that he wants us to see the impact of it. And any time that you start to limit what God knows, you limit his infinity and his unlimited nature, his eternity, his incomprehensibility. Some of these things are going to be held in tension as long as we're believers. We're never, I don't think, ever have a definitive, clear answer for everybody's opposition to our positions. The, the goal in that is to make sure that we allow God to remain God and that we don't change him to, to collate to what we can comprehend, but we submit ourselves and just be willing to say, I don't know, so that we can try to understand him. You mentioned something along the lines of Mm, we need to be honest and cautious in our pursuit of knowledge. And the question is, 
in a cautious pursuit of knowledge, knowledge, what should we be honest about? Our limitations. We need to be, make sure that we, we know that no matter uh, how much we know, it's never enough, right? In my studies, I had a professor who always challenged me. And I didn't understand it at the time, but I, I appreciate it now. He would always tell me, Mike, the horizon of your knowledge is the frontier of your ignorance. No matter how far you push, there's always somewhere else you can push and go and learn and know more. No matter how complete you think your understanding is, it's never fully complete. All we had to do was sit down with someone who studied different sets of material and talk, have the same conversation. They bring up new details, new understanding. So, so in our pursuits of knowledge, we, we don't need to necessarily think that we are infallible. That's another aspect of who God is that we can, we can talk about. We, we are fallible. I am comprehending. I am interpreting. And so to be cautious in a pursuit of knowledge is to know that about me and what my limitations are. And, and honestly, to, to pray the prayer of David in Psalm 119, Lord, open my eyes that I can see wonderful things from your law, especially when it comes to our pursuit of knowledge in Scripture. Um, our pursuit of knowledge in Scripture is aided by the Spirit who inspired the Word, who now illuminates the Word, and so He is a trusted guide, and He is a faithful steward. So we can know, we just need to make sure we're honest with ourselves about our limitations. All right. You mentioned something along the lines of uh, knowing God and knowing facts about God. We can walk into eternity with... Uh, having a lot of knowledge about God, but not actually knowing God. And the question is, what's the difference between knowing God and knowing facts about God? How can we ensure that we truly know him? Yeah, so that's, that's the old cliche of, of the difference between 18 inches, between your head and your heart. Um, being in a faith relationship with God is not the same as knowing the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. You can know Jesus was born in Nazareth, and you could also know that Jesus was crucified by the Romans, that he stood trial under Pontius Pilate. You can know that he walked on water. You can, you can know what the Bible teaches as fact, and you can still not have a personal faith relationship and have confessed your sins and repented of your sins and trusted him. So you can know, and then Jesus even warns of this, right? He says, many of you are going to be in that day, and you're going to say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not do great things in, in your name? And Jesus is going to say, depart from me, for I never knew you. Not because he didn't understand our, his knowledge of us in that sense, but because we never were his to be known, as we read that passage out of uh, tonight, that God knows those who are his. And there's a knowing on his part that's different than just our existence. It's, it's our faith relationship. So that is, that, is, that is definitely necessitated by a personal faith relationship with Christ. That is the ultimate for faith and knowledge, and that's where it begins. Let's see. There's a lot of questions that are not necessarily that's for, the, that's for the panel next week. Yeah, next week. That's, that's Dr. Johnson's question. <laughs> that's the panel that you're question. not going to be part of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Good night, I guess David. Good to see you back there, by the way. We'll, we'll do one of these questions, or one of the less popular ones, but it's still uh, related to this I'm topic. Just, How can I know? It's kind of in the same theme of this last question. How can I know that I am saved? I believe in Christ and his sacrifice for my redemption, but what if it's just knowledge I accept and it's not reality? How do I know? Is it changing you? I mean, you can have facts that you don't act on. My doctor says I should eat less processed fats. I don't care. <laughs> I eat what I want to eat, right? Um, there are lots of things that we know as fact that don't impact who we are. Uh, there, there's something about being born again, about becoming a new creation that's unforgettable. Uh, when old things pass away and new things come, when we, when we truly do 
experience the joy of the Lord in salvation, we're probably not asking questions of is this real. You know, most of the time, and, and other pastors probably have different experience, most of the time I get that question, it's someone living in rebellion and intentional sin. And they want to know why they can't be comfortable doing both. And I think our churches are full of a lot of people who claim to be born again later in life and what they really should have done was re repented of their rebellion. And so you can, one, one way we know we have this assurance, you know, God, God knows us. We have his, his heart. We, God knows those who are his and he doesn't forget. The Spirit speaks, the Spirit affirms, the Word comforts. There's lots of things, right? There's fruitfulness in our lives. God said that by this you will demonstrate that you are my disciples, that you bear much fruit. And so fruitfulness is a part of that. There's a lot that goes into just more than just attendance at church or checking boxes for making us feel saved. And if your concept of salvation is an emotion, that's not salvation. It's emotionalism. Uh, it can change. You can have an emotional response to the song, I want to know you, and I want to know you more, and it not be a true desire of your heart. And I think one of the keys also is that as we, as we are Christians, we start to delight in him. We actually start to enjoy fellowship with him and fellowship with his people. And so it becomes less progressive, less works-based, less about performance and more about being. And folks, if you're not pursuing being a person of Christ, you're just existing. And that's not what you're called to be. In 1 Corinthians 2.16, Paul says, For who has known the mind of the Lord that he will instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. Does he imply we know the mind of God because we have the mind of Christ? He implies you do know the mind of God through Christ, especially in relationship to your salvation. Uh, you, you know, that, that context is, you know, Paul's writing to that church at Corinth, and they would be a pretty good case study for the American church, right? They were pretty jacked up. You guys know that, right? Yeah. They were living in unrepentant sin. They were bragging about all the things that they were doing wrong, and he's... He's asking, you know, them to do things that, that need to be done to get right. And, and there is a reality that God has never had a counselor that he needed. And yet, when we became Christians, when we became followers of Christ, he gave us the mind of Christ. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit that helps us to know the things of God. When Jesus was about to depart, he said, I will send another helper who is like me. He will, he will lead you into all truth. And so as believers, we do have the mind of Christ. And it's not just this, this, this aspect of, well, can we know God fully? No, we can't fully comprehend an incomprehensible God. But there are some things about God, and there's some things about his purposes for God that we can take a lot of the guesswork out of. This is the will of God for your life, your sanctification. That's not up for debate. That's not one of those gray areas where we get to try to figure out, is this applied to me? Yes, it does. The Great Commission, right? Go and make disciples of all nations. Well, that's for the people on that side of the room. These people are off the hook. No, that's not how it works. In fact, when we want to know the will of God and we want to try to experience what the mind of Christ looks like in practicality, most of us should just obey what we already know. 90% of knowing the will of God is obeying what he's already revealed. And so it's not mystical. It's not this 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 work your way into knowledge with God. It's obeying what he's already revealed. And, and the spirit convicts, the, the, the spirit affirms, the spirit edifies, right? And this is the mind of Christ in you. In fact, over in Colossians, he goes further. You don't just have the mind of Christ. This is, this is the hope of glory, right? Christ in me. We, we have the very presence of a living, eternal God in us, and that gives us our sense of eternity with him, and, and, and we don't need to reject that. We don't need to deny that. But I think also we don't need to complicate that. It is isn't indisputable that God is omniscient, but how does one go about uh, with prophecies that seemed to have failed? For example, 
Ezekiel 29 wrote that Babylon would conquer Egypt, but it failed. I'm not familiar with this, but I would, I would have to study that passage to see exactly what we're referring to and what, what that is. I, I don't know I don't know that reference right offhand, so I'm going to apologize for that. I'd have to study that to see what you're referencing. Um, I don't believe that. I mean, if, if I'm just pulling off biblical history here, so don't judge me as a heretic. But when it when then the how Joash got killed, he went out to intervene between a battle between Egypt and Babylon when he should have stayed home. I don't know. Maybe I'm getting my biblical stories wrong, but. Um, Another place you can go to look is, is this also with God's statement. I think it's in Isaiah 40, 46. Again, don't, don't get me, don't condemn me for not quoting these scriptures well. Where God says, have I, not, have I not declared it? Have I not determined it? And will I not bring it to pass? Right? God performs his will. If there's an apparent contradiction, um, we have to interpret scripture with scripture. And so we can't just throw the baby out with the bathwater and say, oh, this is, this is by far proof. We have to do our good homework, right, the limitations to our understanding and knowledge and just make sure we're right before we accuse God of being wrong. It might also be the case similar to how God uh, regrets, so to speak, in creating mankind. Maybe it's a similar concept. I think that's all the questions that are related to uh, this topic. Maybe I've missed some, but we'll, we'll start with ones that probably the second most popular, it was the second most popular one, is my parents go to a conservative slash fear slash just, justice preaching church. I want to attend another church uh, where I learn about God, but parents say that I must obey them or else I'll lose God's blessing. What do I do? Well, let me just first say that I'm ever cautious to give definitive instruction for what someone else sh must do. Right? I don't know the full parameters of that scenario. I'm not sure how old you are. I'm not sure if you have the legal freedom to leave or if you have the moral freedom to leave. I, yeah, there, that's a hard one, right? So really that question comes down to what does it mean to honor your father and mother? And I think that's the heart of that question. Yeah. I'm also not sure what the definitions they use of being a justice. Are we talking about social justice, racial justice? I don't know. You I mean, know, it says conservative fear, justice preaching church. Conservative fear. I, okay. I, would, I mean, my assumption would be that they're uh, maybe, maybe it's just a very judge, maybe judgmental church. Hellfire where there's not much, church. yeah, maybe something along okay, those well, lines where there's not much gospel preaching, not, not much of that mercy of God as much as it is do this or else do that or else, I yeah. would assume. Yeah, that's a tough one, right? Because I can't, I can't sit up here and give you permission to disobey your parents if you are 14 years old and you don't have that privilege, right? That's, that's not what I'm going to do, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hedge on that. Um, if you're mature and independent and you're able to seek God on your own and you've got a personal relationship with him, then, then that's a different scenario. But uh, if you want me to give you an answer on that, you're going to have to find me afterwards and let me know the details because I, I'm not going to be your permission to do something wrong, okay? Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, you have to stay in your parents' <laughs> church. <laughs> I still have to stay with my parents. That, I, I guess maybe elaborate for a typical person, or maybe for yourself, how did you know that you were free, so to speak, to do or be whoever you wanted to be uh, and not have to, quote, unquote, obey your parents in that moment? Because you, I, I, you mentioned what moral freedom and financial freedom. Legal or freedom. independence? Yeah. How would you define that? Is there a certain age? Is there a certain amount of, like, you should move out? If you haven't moved out, then you're under your parents yeah, still. Yeah, that, that's, that's still awful subjective case by case, right? For me, I was always a very independent person. Uh, so, so when did I know, I'll just use me, when did I know it was time to leave home? Well, it's because 
to pursue what I felt like was my path, I had to, to go. Um, you know, to be in ministry, to do what I do, you, you don't usually stay in one place. You know, you don't. It's nice to be able to put down roots, but a lot of us don't get to spend our whole life in one place. Um, with that being said, my parents understood, affirmed, and supported the direction I was taking. So for me, it was not a fact of having to leave home. It was a sense of my parents were sending me out. And I think there's a huge difference. Uh, I wasn't actually running away from anything to get to where I was going. My, my parents still to this day love and support me in what I'm doing. Um, and so I would say for you as young adults that are looking at that, parents are going to struggle with you running off to do ambiguous things with unknown people, right? That's just how parents are. I've got four kids of my own. It, it bothers me not to know details. What's your plan? What are you doing? What are you going to be? We're not asking those necessarily because we just want to be helicopter parents and domineer. We've got a few years on you, and we've got a few experiences maybe that you don't even know we have, and so we're trying to protect you from what nobody protected us from. And so don't always think that that's a form of oppression. Maybe that's just the exercise of wisdom. And so make sure you're not running from, and if you are running, know why. What, why are you running? Um, you know, most of us in Christ are free to pursue him, and we're free to pursue his calling on our lives. And our parents and families mostly understand that, but if you're a believer in an unbelieving home, they may not understand that. And there's, there's a balance between honoring them as your parents and, and pursuing Christ and um, not to be a, a hierarchicalist in my ethics, but one of those outweighs the other after a certain period of time. And, and the, you, you know, you also can pursue Christ on your own and, and, and be involved in things without necessarily having to be offensive and to isolate your parents. So I think every situation is different. Your story is not mine. My story is not yours. Um, so we have to use wisdom and we have to seek godly counsel. I'd say seek counsel in community, uh, where you are in, in your work of faith, where you're, where you're attending, and people that you trust. Not just anybody, but, but people who have fruits of righteousness. And, and just seek them out to help you, help you navigate those scenarios. I guess one quick uh, add-on or question. Uh, would you say that honoring parents is a matter of the heart more than it is a matter of like, oh, in order to honor parents, you do this, 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 and this, and you obey until this age or until it's, it's yeah. a... Because like, I, you, I'm assuming you're, you're completely free now. You, you know, you're a leader of your own home, uh, but you still honor your parents. And yet it comes from a, a matter of the heart, like the things that you do uh, would not be honorable in the case of a 10-year-old who is completely dependent on their parents still, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does. You know, every, every parent-child relationship transitions. Most of the time as children age into adulthood, parents become less authoritarian and more of a counselor. I mean, until I had my kids, I had never had kids or experience with parenting. So my father didn't tell me not to have kids. It wasn't his place. But when I had kids, you better believe I called him and said, hey, Dad, how did you deal with me? Because I've got one just like me, <laughs> right? And that, that transition changes. And so, yes, honoring your parents, just like everything else Jesus taught, it, it, it starts in the heart. Right? You can actually obey your parents with a bad attitude. And Jesus told a parable about two sons, and the father sent them into the vineyard, and one said, I'm not going to go, and then he had a broken heart, and he went. And one said he would go and never went. Right? The, 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 the purpose of that, of that story was to help us know that it's, it's not just in the activity, it's in the heart behind it, and that we can change our heart and do right, but just saying the right things is not enough. So it, it, it definitely is a matter of the heart. 
confession of sin is necessary for salvation, is it necessary to confess your sins to a fellow believer? When I, when I first repented, I was forced to do it, and it's a painful memory I suppressed a long time. That's a trick question, and I'll tell you why. It's not necessary for you to kiss, confess your sins to anyone except Christ, right? But James does say that you can confess your sins one to another and find healing. Uh, there, there, there are two different scenarios. So for salvation, no. That's a matter of the heart, right? You can, be, you can be saved alone in a room with your Bible and the Holy Spirit in Christ because confession, if you really understand it, is not just the articulation of what God already knows. Remember, God already knows your heart. God already has, if he wanted to, he could create a complete detailed laundry list of all of our sins. And so confession... It's not just to tell God something as if he didn't know it. It's to agree with God's perspective on what we have come to know. And if we see God as holy and our actions as being offensive, then to confess those sins is to agree with God about that. And as we agree with God about the nature of our sin and how it offends him, then he is faithful and just to forgive us. See, confession isn't just articulation. It's about agreeing with God. It's, it's that sense of, of, of oneness with God in our understanding that leads to cleansing and his faithfulness being, being manifest. But then there's a second sense where when we acknowledge that sin, we confess our sins one to another, that we often do break down barriers of stronghold. I've counseled, not a lot, but I've counseled one, more, more than a handful of young men who were addicted to pornography and usually the fact that they come into my office and have to sit across the desk from me and say, I am struggling with this, is the launching point towards freedom. Because now somebody knows. Somebody, they've been exposed, right? Do you have to go to somebody across the room and say, I'm, I'm a sinner I, and I need to be saved? Well, that's obviously a good thing to maybe share that, but it's not necessary for salvation, but there are going to be some spots in your life where confession of sin are going to be necessary for growth. All right, we'll do two more questions. Uh, Genesis 9, 5 through 6 is a Noah, Noahid law requiring humans to establish courts of justice based on the death penalty. If we, dis if we don't dis get to decide murder is okay, does this make the death penalty not murder and okay, question mark? <laughs> well, I won't, I won't necessarily go into the Noahic law and covenants, but God did create a principle that I think we need to understand. Murder is the intentional taking of the innocent life. And so once you have transgressed the law of God to take life away from the innocent, you are no longer innocent and your life is forfeit. Uh, God set up, whether you like it or not, right, this is God and his omniscience, God did set up in the Old Testament a system of restitution and payment for wrongdoing. If you were to kill your neighbor's ox, you would have to repay him, and you would have to repay him with, with more. You know, that, the principle of an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, is, is based on God's principle of restitution to teach us moral obligation to, to our neighbor. In some ways, all of these, these codes of restitution are to teach us neighbor love. Because if you can just go around killing anybody that you want to without penalty, then you might just actually go be a vast murderer. But murder is the taking of innocent life intentionally. That's why we see when we get into the, the Israel in the promised land and the cities of refuge that he established, God gave an alternative. If you were involved in somehow unintentionally someone lost their life because of something you did you could flee to a city of refuge and the avenger of blood could not pursue you and as long as you stayed there you were safe as long as the high priest was was alive right god gave us a system like that so i would say no having to pay the penalty for for murder is not murder in god's economy that's called justice and like it or not that's exactly what it but it is, because God's got to create some boundaries for you because you won't create them for yourself. All right, final question. Advice you have for leaders of this generation 
uh, youth that leads in ministries? Well, that's, that's the heart of everything I try to, 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 to invest in right there. The first thing I would remind you is God does not call anyone to a ministry that he is not first called to himself. If you're going to lead, you have to know what you're leading in. That doesn't mean you have to be perfect. It doesn't mean you have to have all the nuances of the spiritual life figured out. But you have to know that you are in relationship with God through Christ, right? God calls us to himself first. And then there's the old principle that you need to know that not all ministry is glorious. In fact, there's an old paradigm that we talk about in ministry. God, God will not use you greatly until he has broken you greatly. Right? That, that's just kind of how it seems to go. Out of our brokenness, God's fruitfulness and faithfulness is observed. If you're engaged in ministry now, I would say make sure that you safeguard your personal walk with Christ. There is no substitute for personal reading and study of the Bible, for personal prayer and personal devotion. One of the great temptations of vocational ministry or even volunteer ministry is you start to replace your relationship with God with your activities. You think if you're busy, you're faithful. That's not the case. It, it may be true, but it's not always true. It's, it's the concept of you can be an inch deep and a mile wide. You can cover a lot of territory but have no substance. And, and then you can also be so focused that you can be an inch wide and a mile deep and no one can ever benefit from you because there's no coverage. And what God wants of us is rivers of flowing living water that we are malleable and, and pliable in his hands and so make sure that you, you never forsake your personal devotion for busyness and, and then challenge yourself. Remember, the faith is to be reproducible. Right? We are to make disciples. So if, you, if you're not sure how to answer the questions, how would you lead someone to Christ, lead someone into a personal relationship of devotion, lead them into uh, how to walk faithfully as a Christian, then you need to pursue someone out in your life who can help you answer those questions yourself because then you will be an effective tool in ministry. And, and don't, don't think that the absence of answers is, is necessarily wrong. None of us have all the answers. We're all, we're all hopefully trying to figure it out. But that is best done in community. We, we are best shaped by the church of the living God around us. And so... You know, as you're, as you're experiencing ministry, as you're engaging in ministry at a young age, um, keep those things in mind. And then the third one, don't believe all the horror stories that all us old guys tell. Okay? It's not as bad as sometimes we make it out to be. Well, thank you for that, Mike. And that concludes this session. As was mentioned uh, several times throughout this evening, we actually sent out an invite to all the... Uh, professors, doctors, pastors that came up on stage over the course of this series, and we invited them to a Q&A, because everybody loved the Q&As. We invited them to a Q&A. Except for them. Yeah, except for them. <laughs> Joke's on us. <laughs> he actually, you actually did all your homework, too. You, you, got, like, you, you got to listen to every Q&A, huh? And yeah, I had the benefit of going last, so I went back and watched all the previous <laughs> episodes, and I, I kind of knew what was, was coming. But uh, it'd be nice if they made you submit your questions a week in advance. That'd be great. Yeah. So we, we're actually going to post. Do we have that link, Steve? Uh, we're going to, if we don't, we'll post it in our chats. But if he can project it, he'll project it. We'll, we'll post a link that's going to last all through Thursday night. So everybody can access it, submit questions, because we want to create questions that may be the the whoever joins us from the panel is able to prepare for m more more in depth maybe bring scripture because it, it is it's one thing to be able to answer a question off the whim 
and that's, it's a blessing, especially when you know uh, the, the answers right away. But w with, with plenty of study, you can really answer a question, and I think that would be beneficial for all of us. So I hope you guys are all excited for that. We're gonna have the QR code uh, either posted or up on the screen. And so that's next week. It'll be all basically Q&A. And then we also have uh, tea that's gonna happen after this, as you guys have noticed. And it was, it, it's been a blessing to have tea. I would, we want someone to help us clean up tonight because the team that's creating the, the tea, uh, they have to leave right away. So if anybody's willing to stay back and, and help clean up, that'd be awesome. And I don't know if I'm missing anything else. Conference, again, uh, happening May 3rd. If you want to help right now, we're opening up the opportunity for people to volunteer. <coughs> Takes a lot of work. Like we, we said, three, three other churches are gonna join us. So we'd really appreciate work. Uh, we, we have to create, uh, we have to make food for lunch. We have to create activities for break time. And the topic, by the way, is evangelism, which you kind of mentioned several times throughout your, uh, even within Q&A and in, in your teaching that ultimately all of our ministries kind of focus around that and promoting the ministry of reconciliation, bringing people to Christ and growing the family of God, or how Tim says, make heaven crowded. So uh, with that, if you, if you want to volunteer for that conference, please come up to me and I'll sign you guys up. I think that's it. Thank you again. Well, we'll uh, let's, let's thank Dr. Mike. And also let, let's, let's thank his family. They also made the journey out here. Uh, I think it was one hour of driving. We'll have you uh, pray, Mike, if you can, and then we'll finish off the evening. All right. Well, Father, thank you again for this night to be together to fellowship. Lord, we pray that you were glorified in all that we sang and all that we said. And Lord, we pray that when we leave this room, our lives would be uh, geared toward bringing glory to you always. So, Lord, we pray that you would lead us and guide us and direct us, help us to know the path to walk. And Lord, we just pray that as our brother just mentioned, that our our endeavors would be engaging in the ministry of reconciliation for the glory of Christ. And so, Lord, to you be honor and glory in all things forever. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.